Americans have long taken pride in fighting for ideals. After World War II, US citizens take it for granted that if war comes again, they will again fight and win the good fight. Everybody in my generation had the expectation that there would be a war to fight. It's what happens when you're the children of World War II veterans. But what happened was the war in Vietnam. After being drafted, I landed in Cameron Bay. I remember the smells, the kind of a mildewy, musty scent to the air. And I remember thinking, this place is going to be dangerous. It was just chaos. The enemy seemed to be everywhere, and was. The Vietnam War was the first reality TV I ever saw. The Battle of Yard Valley, a CBS News special report. It was CBS, Walter Cronkite. Good evening and Dan Rather out there in the jungle. This is the 25th Division, the newest troops in South Vietnam, the United States. And you're seeing the gruesome nature of the war. Now, that's going on at the same time there's a draft. And if you get drafted, you're going into something that is absolutely no picnic. And you know it. The television made it clear this war is rotten. Yet people were being drafted, and they found themselves there. They found their officers telling them to burn some village down. The Marines have burned this old couple's cottage. So people saw the huts being burned of the villagers in Vietnam. This is what the war in Vietnam is all about. What in the hell are we doing that for? What's that about? What kind of a war is this? Why are we there anyway? In the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. Anyway, now man. about two weeks before I left country, I got I got to leave the country 20 days early. For some reason, they asked me if I wanted to leave 20 days early, and I said, "Is a 400 pound flea fat?" <laughs> they said, "Huh?" I said, "Yes, sir. I would." <laughs> well, on down the line, that's another story. But me and a guy from Texas. Bain, the first class to run the warehouse, we had to take Quaviet, which was a little base two miles from the DMZ. That basically it was an army base that changed people quite often if there was any left. Because they would go out and do patrols at night. And in order to get the minesweepers to sweep the highway to get out of the name, the third day we tried to get out of the name, we finally got out of the name. Bain was driving one truck, another guy was driving behind us in another truck. And me and Jock, we were on the big trucks, five ton, with M16s, shotguns. We got, and it's a good asphalt road, just straight, you know, just of course, after we got out of the mountains and that beautiful country, rainforest, monkeys, birds, all kinds, waterfalls, got a few pictures somewhere. But then you get out to flatland. Anyway, we get up and we're getting close to a timber line. And I don't know, you know, I don't know, we're just watching, trying to pay attention. And then we come up, and we're getting pretty close to the timber line from here to that far fence line between them trees mm -hmm. and we can see some some guys in some black uniforms pajama type things we get up close hey they got guns and they're not m16s and bane he's very outspoken driving the truck they can't 
speak English, we can't speak Vietnamese. So he said, get your butt out of the way before I run you over. He said, I got, I got the delivery to make. So he just puts it here and, and they got a little deal to drop across the road and everything. Well, we take off, but we don't, we drive for not real far. Maybe a mile. And the road just goes to nothing, down to dirt, and into nothing. There is no road. It's just jungle. Then he stops, the truck behind him stops. He said, uh, the guy gets out, comes up, talks to me. He said, I think you missed your turn. He said, well, evidently, he said, where in the hell did the road go? He said, I ain't sure. He said, I think we better go by. He said, I think I saw the turn, but you just drove past it. He said, well, I never saw nothing. He turned around and he took off. Bain finally got that, because we were loaded. We was heavy. He got that five ton turned around and headed out. In my opinion, I don't know to this day, but in my opinion, when we crossed past that checkpoint, we were going into the DMZ. Either that or North Vietnam. I'm not sure. Anyway, we made it. He back. He found the turn. We went. And Quaviet was like, you look out there, see the little gray box sitting over there? Mm -hmm. That was the top of the roofs. It's just just enough for a, a window. Everything else is underground. And, but there's a Constantine wire all around it. And one guard shack, which is also underground, pretty much. We get there and we get everything unloaded, and eat a little bit. And that guy said, you better get your butt on the road and hammer down. He said, you got to get back past. There was one official army base, little base, that you had to go past the checkpoint in order to be able to get to the guard shack to go into it to spend the night. If you're past whatever time it was, you don't get past that checkpoint for no reason. You spend the night out there. Bain said, well, we got time to make it. And he said, if you hurry, you will. He said, finish your meal, let's go. Well, we didn't have to unload the truck. The other guys that was that worked there was on that base, they did. Well, there was a guy that went up there that I went through counterinsurgency school between Connecticut and going over there that was in Virginia. But so I asked him, he said, he ain't here no more. He said he got jungle right in his legs and said last we heard he was a tripler and they weren't real sure they could save his either legs so I, I don't know from here at that tree line down there's the ocean and this is over on the I guess to be the west side of Vietnam up there and he said, out there a mile and a half, which is not very far on water, because you can see a long ways. <coughs> I said, see that island? Not looking, I said, must be high tide. I don't see no island. He said, I remember three months ago, there was a pretty good sized island out there. He said, and we sat here and watched for, he told me a certain amount of time and said that the little Vietnamese people, they, they had these little round, it was like a dish. Little sand pans, they call them, a little boat. Mm -hmm. And they had their one paddle, they'd, they'd go through the water, just not very, just constantly. Well, finally they figured out, well, dummies, that's the VC out there, they're supplying that island, they're gonna do something. Well, that's after they had, was it the New Jersey or the Missouri? That last battleship that they recommissioned and put in and went over to Vietnam, waters. He could shoot them 16 inch guns for like 20 miles, which you can't see, mm -hmm. but 13 miles. If six foot person looks, he can see the top of a six foot person if it's dead calm, smooth. Mm -hmm. But it was coming by, so after dark that night, they started firing. We could see the flash when they fired, 
and then see the explosion. He said, when we got up the next morning, there wasn't no island left. It's gone. He said, that's what you're looking at. I said, my gosh. He said, there ain't been nobody no sand pans out there anymore either. I said, well, I guess not. But then anyway, we left and he hammered down on our way back. We had a couple of those Cobra helicopters. And we're just as fast as that five ton would run, maybe 60 miles an hour. Because we were empty and we were headed out. These two Cobra helicopters, you know, one pilot sits behind the other one. Mm -hmm. See, them. one come up and one went. We had one on this side of us, one on this side of us. We'd wave at them, they'd wave back, you know. And we'd go, and they followed us for a ways because they were probably on a patrol, watching, looking. Well, they all of a sudden, he just kind of went, shh, shh, now you, off they went. They disappeared. Me and Jock, we're standing up, the wind's blowing in our face. It's getting to be evening time, cooler. And way up, because I don't know how many long ways up the road we see a person come out on a highway and then leave. Well, we get a little bit closer, and there's something in the middle of the highway. And we get up close, and we kind of look at each other, and we're going, it, it, does he see that? About the time we re I started to reach down and holler at him, we just went over it. That night, because we barely, I mean, we had like 30 seconds before we was going to get stopped at the checkpoint. But we did make it through. We went to that base, got the shower that night. Didn't have any clean clothes, but we got the shower that night, got a good meal, and went over to what they called the club, the Quonset Hut, where you can get you a beer or soda pop if you wanted it. And we were sitting around talking to some of the guys. Bane, he was sitting over there with the first class guys. And I got to talking. Bane gets up and come over and sits there at our table. He said, because we tell him about it after we got to the base, about didn't you see that object that guy come out and put in the road? And he said, I never saw nothing. Well, from where we were, where he was inside the truck looking, he may not have been to see what we saw, but he, he had to have seen this. And he said, how big was it? We said, oh, it's about, about that big, big round, about that long. He said, what color was it? He didn't know, but he'd been talking to these army guys so we said it's black and about the first four or five inches was white. So he went back over and sat down and talked to him a little bit and then he come back over and he said, you know what that was? Don't have a clue, look like a big bullet to me. He said, that's probably an eight inch armor piercing projectile. Some of the native people close by, they found it, it didn't explode. So they pulled out, hoping we would stop and give them something for it and sell it back to us. Mm. Or they had it rigged where they could make it detonate if we stopped. Anyway, he said, if I'd have hit it, he said, we wouldn't be sitting here now. But there's things, you know, you don't want to remember certain stuff. You hear stories all the time. Sure. Always hear stories. Well, sometimes it's not the story, it's the real thing. Let's see if I can get through with this. The guy I knew saw him in a club one night on base after we was all off. He said, he called and he said, man, he said, I got a dear John later. He said, what in the world? He said, what can I do about it? He said, can't go home, try to fix things. He said, gee whiz. About 10 minutes later, I heard a gunshot. And he was a guy that I saw quite often, spoke to him every time I saw him. He's in the Army. He carried a 45. Well, after the gunshot, he committed suicide right out there in front, of, in the middle of the road, in front of the cut. His wife seen him at Deer John Lander. That was over it. He just committed suicide. And there's so much of that. The drugs, God, we'll never know what went on. The tunnels that the VC and NBA dug, I mean, they go from here to Ada. 
underground. You didn't know. And it's not just a tunnel. It goes this direction, that direction. You don't ever know how far. It's extremely difficult at that time to, you know, they couldn't ground penetrate, find nothing. But they would every once in a while dig a little, they found out and figured out, they'd dig a little deal. If they thought that somebody was coming in, I mean, it's dark, you, you don't see nothing. And you go in there, you don't use a flashlight, you go slow and listen. Well, they're good enough, that they're back in one of these little cuppy holes, they wait till somebody goes by and then just shoot them or stab them or something. The guys got to learning, man, I don't want to go down in there and say, hey, I'm a cat hair, am I going to know if anybody's there or not? And they give them enough drugs, they go, got to where they wanted to go. And if you wanted anything, if you just asked, because I saw a bunch of it, and I'd run people, when I was on the maintenance, we had a Quonset hunt, we kept the tools and supplies and stuff in, and a couple guys wanted to start coming in there and sitting around while they, they had their drugs and stuff, and one of them, I don't know what he did, but he never did come back. The other one, they put him in jail. We called it 4050. And everywhere he went, I mean, everywhere he went, from the time he got out of his bunk, he had two MPs, one on each side. And if they said, jog, we're going from here to there, you jog. If he got tired, and didn't jog, they'd grab him the arm, they'd drag him. And they were big enough they could. Well, this one guy, they were allowed visitors once in a while. Not very often, but, and they'd search him and all this, and they, they well, I, this guy, I saw him quite a bit, and we'd have to go down to the, on base down to public works, where the CBs had their shops, electrical, plumbing, whatever, and knew all them guys. <clears throat> had to go by 40, 50 deal, and he'd be out there. His job was filling sandbags, and they didn't run out of sandbags to fill. They always had plenty of sand, they always had plenty of bags. And then he had to load them up on a truck, and then he'd start filling some more. He was, they took him to the shower one night, told him to brush his teeth and he couldn't get his toothpaste out of the tube of toothpaste because somebody had smuggled in a toothpaste full of hash and that's why he couldn't squeeze it out. You know. Anyway, he was there about, for about another weekend and I don't know where they sent him but he, he's gone. what they called the highway. It was a good paved road that went to places, you know, you could veer off and go to here, to there, to whatever. But on this road that I had to travel between Tinshaw, the base I was on, and the supply depot, you went by and there was a little white hut. I mean, it, this ain't a six by six. It's not even an A bay, it's a small. You go in the door and there's a barber chair in one window and a door, and that's it. It's just, you know, tall enough for an American, I say, because mm -hmm. Vietnamese ain't that tall. Mm -hmm. But you go by and almost every day, there's a little motorcycle, a little Honda 50 or whatever, you park next to it, same one. And if he's not sitting out front, there's somebody in the chair and he's giving a haircut to. Who is that guy? I said, oh, he's a, he's the barber around here, he said, he made him pretty good money. He said, the, man, them officers, they like him because he, man, he, he cut it good, you know. And then they're helping the local people and stuff, and they give him a little money, you know. And it's cool. So we rock on. I see, you know, once in a while, you'll see a Jeep with the flags up on it. You know, it's some kind of pretty high-ranking officer. And then one day, we drive by for two days. The door's not even open. No motorcycle, no Jeeps, no nothing. After about a week, get to noticing it. What happened to the barbers? Oh, you didn't hear? I said, no, what happened? Said, he was a VC. Said, <gasps> after they 
because he asked somebody a question one day and they thought, well, that's kind of unusual. They got to thinking he might be a VC. Of course, they had a photo of him and they find out he's a, an officer at the VC. He'd been cutting all these hairs, listening to him talk the whole time they're in the barber chair, like men do. Mm -hmm. When he finds out the information he's wanting or enough, he's gone. Never see him again. In the Vietnamese army, they may take 50 guys over to a different country and train them. You know, and they got normally Marines or armies that have been deployed and did their tour and stuff, lived through it, but they have found out they train not only other Americans, but they also train the Vietnamese army how to do all kinds of stuff. And it's a six weeks course. They're all of them there every day, all day, every day, talk to each other, do everything, live together till graduation day. And there's 20 of them. Come gradu graduation day, there's only four. You just train 16 NBA. And you don't ever know it. You can't tell one from the other. That's the first thing they tell you. Say, you don't know one from the other. Who's who? How many women were in the VC? Did they did they catch through oh, there? Yeah. Oh yeah, they had. Uh, I won't say a lot, but some. I think that some of them got into the army because just to keep from being killed. Because if they went into a village and, and, you know, if the South Vietnamese army went into this village and they thought there was a couple of Viet Cong or NVA living in there and they didn't know, you know, that's where his family lived. Well, they just grab a woman and she's pregnant and they say, you better tell me who's who. If not, I'm going to kill her. And nobody speak up. They take the knife and just rip her open, throw her down and grab another one. I mean, there's things like that went on all the time, every day. You never knew. And they, even they didn't know. The good story I heard. Of course, now, Vietnam is Vietnam. It's not North and South anymore. But after the war was over, they had patrol boats running rivers. You, know, you hear about that. And at the time, we had some guys come in when they very first started the hydrofoils. You know, They were good, except if they went out into the ocean, if the waves were very big, the sensors, they never did get them at that time. Bugs worked out. Because the sensor may sense it and raise it up too much, or it may go the other way. You never knew. But on the flat rivers, they were good because they could hover and they did have the capability of the engine that run them. They could muffle it down pretty good. Like some of the helicopters, they can almost make it to where you can't hear it. Mm -hmm. well, they, they could do some of the exhaust off them diesel engines to where they, they were pretty quiet, really. But, I mean, a river is a river, and they can get a pretty good-sized boat. Have you ever been to southern Missouri where the, is it the White River that comes out of the mountain? It starts the big fancy trout stream up there. No. Uh, I mean, it's... it's I've rock, heard about it. It's a rock mountain. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. a big hole, and its water's just gushing out. Mm -hmm. Well, they had one over there that was kind of like that. Water was moving all the time. And they knew something was going on, but that was before night vision stuff. And they didn't quite have that yet. But they would sit and watch on the banks of the river and stuff, and the patrol boats would go up and down, and they couldn't catch anybody. Very rare occasion, never catch anybody doing anything. When the war was over, pitch black nights, I mean, when it's pitch black, no moon, because you know, starlight can be pretty bright mm -hmm. if there's no light interference. Mm -hmm. Monsoon, when it's cloud covered, there is no light 
it's dark. They were good enough. They had a city inside. Americans, nobody had French. They never went inside because they didn't figure, you know, going there, the water gets out. We don't want to. Well, hell, that river, you could go. They would actually take big boats with lots of people and supplies. During dark, super quiet. You know, do the little paddle. And they would maneuver. They might have poles to see where they were at, you know, certain one. They would actually go in there. Hell, they had a city back in there. I mean, high-ranking officers and stuff. They had rooms. They had meetings. All kinds of stuff. They never knew that till the war was over and they showed them. Marble Mountains where they got their marble. I mean, it was a good marble. And they finally figured out some bull. When they first got there, you'd see it at night. You know, he'd be sitting outside looking or something because it was hot. You look over and all of a sudden you see a, a light just start, just go. And it's just just a light. And it's a, like a ribbon. And it, just, and it moves. And then, psh, that's a helicopter. On patrol, they've seen something and they're shooting and that's the tracers that you're seeing. Mm. Every third round's a tracer. But it looks like a solid line way over there. Well, finally, they figure out that, hey, man, they're living in there somewhere, but they got tunnels, and they find some entrance to some tunnels, but they don't want to go in very far. They said, well, we can just, we can just fill that sucker full of smoke and find out where the entrances and exits are, and said, and we'll just capture them. Well, they tried smoke, and then they got a whole bunch more smoke, and they put smoke in it, and it was like a piece of, real good Swiss cheese. There were so many holes in that mountain that they had no idea. All they could do is surround it and try not to let anybody in or anybody out. <laughs> oh my gosh. But they probably had tunnels under it anyway. Mm -hmm. My fellow Americans, five years ago, American combat troops were first sent to Vietnam. The war since that time has been the longest and one of the most costly and difficult conflicts in our history. I am therefore tonight announcing plans for the withdrawal of an additional 150,000 American troops to be completed during the spring of next year. You know, when he campaigned in 1968, Richard Nixon said that if you elect him, he would uh, end the war and win the peace. These are encouraging trends. In this speech, it's almost like he's saying the Vietnam War is on the cusp of being over, that we finally reached the light at the end of the tunnel. We finally have in sight the just peace we are seeking. It must have been a very satisfying speech for Americans to watch on their TV to realize that this ordeal might finally be over. But here's the thing, Richard Nixon was lying. He was planning on extending the war into an entirely new country. The military brass has been telling Nixon that the communists have this secret mobile headquarters in which they're running the whole effort, and it's in the jungles of Cambodia. And that if they can hit that, then the whole communist war effort just dissolves. Nixon called me down to his office around the 27th or 28th. And he says, we're going into Cambodia. I said, are we bombing them? Then they're gonna know we're coming. And Nixon said, no, we've been bombing them for a long time. The country had come to believe, partly on the basis of that April 20th speech, that we were gradually moving out in a pretty high clip and a pretty high rate and all of a sudden there's a new war in Cambodia. But Nixon said, look, these guys are attacking American soldiers in Vietnam. They got these privileged sanctuaries. I'm gonna go in and clean them out. The time has come for action. Attacks are being launched this week to clean out major enemy sanctuaries on the Cambodian-Vietnam border. Nixon said, I'm not gonna be the first president to lose a war. Well, one way not to be the first president to lose a war is to win it. 
if the United States of America acts like a pitiful, helpless giant, it is not our power, but our will and character that is being tested tonight. We will not be humiliated. We will not be defeated. I promise to win a just peace. I shall keep that promise. The first American troops crossed the Cambodian border within minutes after President Nixon announced the operation to the nation. Most of the men had no idea they were going across the border until this morning. Okay, you asked for a taped letter, so uh, I'm here about five or six miles from the Cambodian border. It's pretty thick down there, and it's supposed to be an estimated battalion size four. The gooks just moved in there, about 4,000. We were young kids. I was a college student fighting a war. I remember we had gotten a phone call saying that we're shipping the unit to Cambodia. Uh, and we all started laughing, you know, we're not going to Cambodia. We'd heard rumors, of course, that there were some serious NVA there and a lot of equipment, but we had no idea that the president had a strategy or an announcement or anything. No sense of the scope or range of the incursion. They issued us bayonets for the first and only time in Vietnam, which kind of gave some of us the clue that things might not be so good in Cambodia. <laughs> 